In this particular video, we're going to see on the introduction to the pituitary gland. So this is just an introductory video, but really a very important one. So because this is going to build up your basics for the future understanding of the pituitary gland and the related disorder. So let us understand it much better through this video, which is going to be extremely simple. So let us see the basic anatomy, the functional anatomy of the pituitary gland. How does it look like? So when, when I draw the pituitary gland, I usually tend to draw something like this, even though this is not the exact anatomy, but let us assume this is the pituitary gland. And also I'm going to put a dotted line, something like this. You might ask me why, because what I'm trying to tell here, this is the anterior pituitary gland and this is the posterior pituitary gland. You know the anterior pituitary gland is also referred to as adenohypophysis and the posterior pituitary gland is also referred to as neurohypophysis. Clear? But why it is called by different names and what is the significance? Let us see after some time. But right now, trust me, this is the anterior pituitary gland and the anterior pituitary gland and the adenohypophysis has three different parts. One is the pars distalis and second one is the pars intermedia that actually forms the boundary between the anterior and the posterior pituitary and the ever important pars tuberalis. So this is the pars tuberalis. I can write simply as T but I can write this is the pars tuberalis. I'll tell you the importance of tuberalis in some time. So what is the importance of this pars distalis? This pars distalis is the one that are going to have majority of the secretory cells of the anterior pituitary, which means the cells that are going to secrete a variety of hormones that you see the classic FSH, LH, then uh, your uh, ACTH, TSH, all these classic hormones are going to come from the pars distalis portion only that is from the anterior pituitary that is pars distalis part of the anterior pituitary. Now you have a very important organ and a very important area in the brain that's called a hypothalamus and this hypothalamus is going to extend downwards and they form the posterior pituitary which means the origin is extremely different for posterior pituitary. And since it's a direct extension of the hypothalamus, which means direct extension of the brain downwards and they form that extension, that's what we refer to as the posterior pituitary, which means this posterior pituitary is a direct extension of the hypothalamus itself. It's a downward extension of the hypothalamus. That's why this is referred to as a neurohypophysis. But embryological wise, if you ask where the posterior pituitary is originating from, it is originating from the neural ectoderm. That is another reason why it is called as neurohypophysis and which is the origin that is diencephalon. Why diencephalon? Because I told you it's the downward extension of the hypothalamus and all the thalamic structures including thalamus, epithalamus, subthalamus, hypothalamus including the optic nerve. So all these thalamic and optic nerve structures are originating from the diencephalon only. So which means that is the reason why it is called a neurohypophysis because it's a direct extension of the neural ectoderm downwards and form the pituitary gland. But whereas this anterior pituitary's origin is a bit different, it's going to origin from the oral ectoderm. So where oral? Typically from the pharyngeal ectoderm. So this pharyngeal ectoderm and pharynx, they form a pouch and upward extension. How diencephalon forms a downward extension? from the hypothalamus and form the posterior. Similarly, this forms an upward extension from the pharynx, clear, and both unite together to form a full pituitary gland. So, which means that upward extension, that's a pouch-like structure that formed from the pharyngeal ectoderm is what we refer to as a Rathke's pouch or otherwise referred to as a hypophyseal pouch. So, that's the idea. So, clear? So, again, hypothalamus forms different structures. You know, this downward extension is called posterior pituitary. And they form another structure here. This is what we refer to as infundibulum. Clear? And they form another area here near the pars tuberalis. This is what we call as an ever important part that is called a median eminence. So these are very, very important structures and very crucial for understanding. 
And remember this pars tuberalis and the infundibulum part, these two are together going to be called as the stalk of the pituitary gland. This is what we refer to as the famous pituitary stalk. When somebody asks you what are the constants of the pituitary stalk, you have to be very sure that it is formed by the pars tuberalis of the anterior pituitary and the infundibulum of the hypothalamus and the posterior pituitary. So these two together, these two together will contribute to the pituitary stalk. And stalk is a very important area of the pituitary because whenever the stalk is damaged, it is going to result in a stalk effect and it is going to cause a drop in the all the hormone levels in the pituitary except for prolactin which we will see why later on because prolactin is under the inhibitory control so stark damage will cut the inhibitory control and resulting in excessive prolactin release. So fine we will see that later on. So this is a very very important part of the pituitary gland called as pituitary stark. And what is the importance of this again? So remember the neurons that are coming from the hypothalamus let us assume these are the neurons that are coming from the hypothalamus, they are two types. One, those that come to the posterior pituitary and they don't have any communication in between. They directly store the hormones in the posterior pituitary and they just release them. That's it. So, which means these neurons just come and store their hormones in the posterior pituitary and they just release them, which means what you are seeing as posterior pituitary hormones are essentially these are hypothalamic hormones. They are not actually posterior pituitary hormones. They are generated from the hypothalamus and they are just stored in the pituitary. You know what are the posterior pituitary hormones? These are nothing but antidiuretic hormone. ADH or otherwise referred to as vasopressin. And second one is oxytocin. If you really ask me what these hormones are, these hormones are just uh, hypothalamic hormones that are stored in the posterior pituitary. They are not synthesized in the posterior pituitary. They are just stored in the posterior pituitary which are directly coming from the hypothalamus. So these neurons are what we refer to as a magnocellular neurons. Okay, let us see the origins and all in some time but these neurons are called as magnocellular neurons. Similarly, you have another group of neurons called parvocellular neurons. Let us assume these are the parvocellular neurons, this orange color structure which I am drawing are parvocellular neurons and these neurons please do remember they do not enter the anterior pituitary at all. Instead they end in this area called median eminence. These parvocellular neurons they go, don't go up to the anterior pituitary, they just end in the median eminence itself and where in the median eminence they are going to secrete a lot of controlling hormones for the anterior pituitary which means they are these parvocellular neurons they don't secrete the I mean your uh, actual anterior pituitary hormones like TSH, FSH, LH and all instead they will be secreting the controlling hormones. These controlling hormones can be stimulating hormones or inhibitory hormones. These controlling hormones can be stimulatory hormones or even inhibitory hormones. The best examples for stimulatory hormones are growth hormone releasing hormone, you have gonadotropin releasing hormone, then you have thyrotropin releasing hormone or TSH releasing hormone, then you have corticotropin releasing hormone. The best examples for inhibitory hormones are growth hormone inhibitory hormone otherwise referred to as somatostatin and you can also have a dopamine. This is not an inhibitory hormone to be honest. This the dopamine is actually a neurotransmitter. Remember, this is the only neurotransmitter that is present in the hypothalamus that are released into the anterior pituitary. Clear? So this is very, very important. So the only the prolactin secretion is under the control of a neurotransmitter. But remaining all the other cells in the anterior pituitary are under the control of a hormone, not a neurotransmitter. So this dopamine is a very important event. Let us discuss in detail in some more time. So these are the inhibitory hormones, so which means they are going to release the controlling hormones into the median eminence. But wait on, so how they can control the anterior pituitary now? By releasing into the median eminence. This is where your hypothalamic hypophyseal portal system comes into play. So what do you mean by a portal system in the first place? So let us understand what do you mean by a portal system and how does it differ from a normal vasculature? Remember a normal vasculature 
you know you have an artery which forms capillary system which forms veins and there is a venous to arterial communication after some time because these veins once again they result in arteries after oxygenation and this cycle will keep on continuing so this is a pump mechanism that happens in the heart and the peripheral circulation so it's very simple straightforward arteries capillaries veins that's it but portal system is not like that so portal system is something different they form arteries which form capillaries all right they form veins and they again break down into capillaries and once again they form a second venous network so this veno venous communication is what we are going to call it as a portal system so the best example you can tell in the form of a portal vein where you have mesenteric arteries mesenteric vasculature which form mesenteric capillaries all right they form the mesenteric veins clear and the portal vein mesenteric veins obviously all the mesenteric veins join together to form the portal vein and which again breaks down in the liver in the form of capillary system this capillary system in the liver we call them as sinusoid so they break down again and they form veins which is nothing but the hepatic vein which is going to enter the ivc so you can see all these things happen in the liver so which means this capillary system is predominantly going to happen in the liver so that is why this is what we refer to as a portal circulation this is a portal vein you can see so the mesenteric veins combined to form portal vein why it's called portal because again it's break down into it's going to break down into capillaries that's called sinusoids in the liver and once again it's going to unite together to form a portal i mean hepatic vein which enters the ivc finally so this veno venous communication is what we called as a portal system similar thing is going to happen in the anterior pituitary also so what's going to happen you know there is an artery called as superior hypophyseal artery let us draw in a separate diagram don't want to confuse here so you have an artery called a superior hypophyseal artery it's the major artery for the anterior pituitary and it's going to form capillary loops where they form capillary loops is in the area of median eminence and here they break down into veins and these veins once again they break down and form capillary plexus in the anterior pituitary and once again they form another venous system so this is a vein this is another vein and there are two capillary systems that are formed so now this is what we refer to as a hypophyseal vein clear hypophyseal veins so what you are essentially seeing here is very simple fact again you have a veno venous communication breakdown so which means this is nothing but a portal system is being formed so what portal system here this is entering the hypothalamic area and coming back to the hypophyseal area that is the pituitary so that's why this portal system is called as hypothalamic hypophyseal portal system why this portal system is very important here because i told you there are certain neurons called as magnocellular neurons isn't it? i mean parvocellular neurons isn't it parvocellular neurons so what parvocellular neurons do they just release the hormones into the median eminence which means these are going to release the controlling hormones in the median eminence so this is the median eminence and they are going to release the controlling hormones just into the median eminence where the capillary loops are formed by the superior hypophyseal artery but it's very simple and straightforward this agents this hormones will be carried by the capillary plexus into the veins and into this capillary plexus once again where they are going to exert the controlling actions on the anterior pituitary very elegant system release in some place collected by the capillary loop and transfer to the distant place that is why these are called as controlling hormones that's that otherwise i will be just calling as controlling factors i told you when it is carried by the blood and to a distant structure where they exert their effect this is what we called as a hormone clear so it's a hormone so they are releasing in the median eminence carried by the capillary plexus and they are again exerting an effect in the little distant area that is in the hypophyseal area that is in the anterior pituitary 
So clear? So the controlling hormones don't directly reach through the neurons to the antipituitary. Instead, they enter the antipituitary through the capillary system and the plexus. That's why this hypothalamic hypophyseal portal system is very, very important for the antipituitary. But on the contrary, your posterior doesn't have any uh, portal system because it's not needed because you know very well the magnocellular neurons are going to directly reach the posterior pituitary where the hormones are just stored in the posterior pituitary and they are released into the veins. So which means here you just have a inferior hypophyseal artery inferior hypophyseal artery which is going to form capillary plexus which ultimately forms the hypophyseal vein which means here you don't need any portal system at all because your hypothalamic hormones through the magnocellular neurons into the posterior pituitary are directly reaching the posterior pituitary where they are stored and released through the hypophyseal vein. So you don't need really a portal system here. So it's a very simple understanding. So this is the basic understanding of a hypothalamic hypophyseal portal system. Clear? So this is what is first of all very very important to understand about the pituitary. So where you have the portal system, where you don't have the portal system, all these things are very important. So with this basic understanding, let us move on. So what are the hormones that are going to come from the anterior and the posterior pituitary? So let us take a pituitary for that matters. And we will put anterior pituitary here and the posterior pituitary. Anterior pituitary. And the posterior pituitary. Clear? Remember, posterior pituitary secretes only two hormones. We know that one is oxytocin and second one is vasopressin. That is ADH. Before even moving to the actual functions of uh, ADH and uh, your oxytocin, let me tell you that what are the mechanism action, how they are going to act, what are the receptors. So remember any hypothalamic hormone, this is a rule I am telling, any hypothalamic hormone which means anything that comes from the hypothalamus, anything either from parvocellular neurons or from magnocellular neurons, either from parvocellular or magnocellular doesn't matter, they will be acting through GPCR pathway only, that is G protein coupled receptor, which means oxytocin and ADH is not an exception. So, they are going to have a G protein coupled receptor mechanism only. Remember, oxytocin is GQ, whereas vasopressin is GQ or GS, depending on the type of the receptor. For example, V1 receptors will be GQ type and V2 receptor will be. Uh, GS type. Remember you have two types of V1 receptors. One is called V1A and V1B. Previously this V1A receptors are called as V1 and V1B receptors are called as V3 receptors. Now we don't call by that name. We call it as V1A and V1B receptors. But the entire V1 receptor is going to act through GQ and V2 receptors are going to act through GS pathway. Clear? Very simple. Any hypothalamic hormone is going to act via G protein coupled receptor and oxytocin is through GQ only. Fine any hypothalamic hormone, anything that comes from the hypothalamus will act through G protein coupled receptor, very important concept. Clear? So these are the two important hormones which I want to tell that come from the posterior pituitary. Remember, this posterior pituitary hormones come directly from the hypothalamus, which means these are actually hypothalamic hormones that are secreted through the posterior pituitary, that's all. There is no formation of these hormones in the posterior pituitary, very important point. And what are these neurons called? These neurons will be called as magnocellular. I am just recapping. An anterior pituitary, we have two types because anterior pituitary are the ones that contain cells, actual secreting cells. They are found in the anterior pituitary only. Remember, actually in the posterior pituitary, there are no secreting cells, which means only anterior pituitary can produce tumors, whereas posterior pituitary cannot produce tumors which means whenever I tell a pituitary tumor, which means it has to come from anterior pituitary only. It cannot come from posterior pituitary. 
because post pituitary has no sex cells that are functional so they cannot produce a tumor that easily at all pituitary tumor means it's a anterior pituitary tumor only so whenever you see for example if you see a mass like lesion in the post pituitary what will you think about so it's not an anterior pituitary suppose i am telling concretely there is a mass lesion in the post pituitary what it must be this must be either a metastasis or it must be a infiltrative lesion infiltrative lesion this must be a metastasis or an infiltrative lesion infiltrative lesion like tuberculosis sarcoid so some infiltrative lesions or lymphomatous infiltration some infiltration or it could be a metastasis that's it it must be a mets or it must be infiltrative lesion they cannot produce a de novo tumor that's what i'm trying to tell in the post pituitary so why mets commonly involve the post pituitary because anterior pituitary it's very difficult to see the mets mets commonly involve post pituitary which means if it involves the pituitary it usually involve the post pituitary so why that is the case why because we have seen here already anterior pituitary has this portal system post pituitary has no filtering system that is there is no portal system that is why the cells can easily reach the post pituitary and they form a collection there that's why you have mets very commonly in the post pituitary if at all it's seen in the pituitary that's why they will ask you any metastatic or infiltrative lesion what is the most common clinical feature metastatic or infiltrative lesion of the pituitary most common clinical feature is diabetes insipidus obviously you have one exception for this fact one exception is there that is called lymphocytic hypophysitis i will tell you that later on why this is an exception but apart from that infiltrative lesion or a metastasis to the pituitary most common clinical feature will be diabetes insipidus that is due to damage to the posterior pituitary clear because adh is secreted from the posterior pituitary loss of adh secretion due to damage to these neurons is what we called as diabetes insipidus or central diabetes insipidus clear so basic understanding okay no cells no de novo tumors cells are there in anterior pituitary so de novo tumors are possible in the anterior pituitary pituitary tumor means an anterior pituitary tumor that's all okay you have anterior pituitary now how you will classify the cells of the anterior pituitary you have two types of cells one is called a chromophil i can write like this one is called a chromophil which means they take up the stain right so say chrome or fill fills they take up they love stains or chromophobes which means they don't take up stain that's why it's called phobes they don't take up the stain how many percentage how much percentage 50% are actually chromophobes and 50% of the antipyretic cells are chromophils which means these are the secretory cells and these chromophobes are non secretory cells which means they don't produce any hormone but they are functional cells only so what are making up the chromophobes somebody asks you they don't ask really but if somebody ask you what are the things that make up the chromophobes means these could be exhausted chromophils which means they are once upon a time a chromophil which are actually secretory now they have exhausted their secretion and they are on the verge of apoptosis and that cells could represent in the pituitary as chromophobes clear next you can get certain stem cells and certain supportive cells are there in the anterior pituitary those can also look like chromophobes because they don't have that secretory granules that are the ones that make them take up the stain the secretory granules that contain the hormones so this all could be chromophobes clear so if they ask you an exam which of the following tumors will not be secretory tumor your answer must be chromophobe cell adenoma they don't secrete anything straight forward chromophils so what are the chromophils you have two types of chromophils one is called an acidophil and second one is called a basophil obviously they take up acidic stain this take up the basic stains in the 50% of the cells how much acidophils contribute 35 percentage which means they are going to be the maximum and basophils contribute only 15 percentage and what are the acidophil cells 
what are the hormones secreted and what are the types of acidophil cells in that you have somatotrophs and you have lactotrophs otherwise called as mammotrophs in that if they ask you which is the most common or the maximum amount of cells that are seen among the acidophils that is the somatotrophs remember somatotrophs single handedly contribute to 50% of the acidophils overall acidophils and it's the maximum number of antiperiodary cell you should be very very uh, clear about that it's a very very important cell you know what somatotrophs do they are going to secrete growth hormone what lactotrophs or mammotrophs are going to do they are going to secrete prolactin clear what about the basophils basophils you have different uh, cells and secrete different types of hormones three different types of cells are there first one we are going to call it as corticotrophs which secrete a very important type of hormone called pomc remember from pomc only you will get acth because acth pomc is a big molecule that is what is secreted then which is actually processed later on to produce acth adrenocorticotropic hormone but pomc is a very important hormone that is the major hormone that is secreted that is called preopio melanocortin apart from that alpha msh lot of other hormones are secreted let us see the structure of the pomc in some time preopio melanocortin in the adrenal area that time you will understand what are the hormones that are secreted but right now understand pomc acts that's it and you have thyrotrophs if somebody ask you what is the importance of thyrotrophs this is remember this is a least number of cells least amount of cells in the pituitary maximum amount of cells maximum number of cells in the pituitary that is somatotrophs that is mammotrophs i mean this somatotrophs are the ones that are going to secrete the growth hormone these are going to be the maximum i told you already 50% least if they ask you it going to be thyrotrophs which secretes tsh that is thyroid stimulating hormone clear third one you have gonadotrophs what they are going to secrete they are going to secrete the gonadotropins they are nothing but fsh and lh so these are the gonadotrophs fine what are the importance of this corticotrophs what are the importance of this corticotrophs remember corticotrophs are the first cells that appear in the fetal life these are the first cells that appear in the fetal life so if suppose someone asks you what is the first pituitary hormone to appear in the fetal life that is acth and the first hormone to appear in the fetal life is cortisol only and it's understandable because cortisol is a stress relieving hormone and it's a hormone that copes up with the stress in the body so to i mean cope up for the growing fetal stress in the womb you definitely need this cortisol in acth so first hormone to appear first pituitary hormone to appear in the fetus you have to answer acth or cortisol cortisol is not a pituitary hormone but this axis hpa axis hormone the first hormone to appear is acth and cortisol in the hypothalamic pituitary axis very very important second hormone in the fetal life if they ask you answer will be somatotrophs that i mean second cell to appear is somatotrophs second hormone to appear is the growth hormone in the fetal life the second hpa axis hormone is growth hormone only do you understand and that is because to produce a fetal growth and these are the two mandatory functions coping of the fetal stress and grow i mean giving the fetus growth both are important that's why these two are the first two cells that appear in the fetal life clear so these are very very important and uh, what is the importance of this gonadotrophs gonadotrophs also have an importance because this is the most common reason the tumors of this area is most commonly found in a non functional adenoma let us see a non functioning adenoma what does it mean non functioning adenoma usually it is originating from the gonadotrophs only let me tell you sometime don't confuse it right now so these are the cells of the anti acidophils and the anterior pituitary predominantly somatotrophs that secrete growth hormone mammotrophs or lactotrophs that secrete prolactin and you have uh, corticotrophs that secrete pomc and in turn acth and thyrotrophs which secretes tsh and your uh, gonadotrophs that secretes gonadotropin that is fsh and lh but let me tell you one important point this all this basophilic hormones are going to act through g protein coupled receptor only clear 
G protein coupled receptor. GPCR is the mechanism for all these basophilic hormones, which means they are going to act through G stimulatory pathway, which is going to increase the cyclic AMP. All the acerophilic hormones, prolactin and growth hormone, TIN, TERS, GH, GMCSF, we have seen already, they are going to work through NRTK pathway. That's called non receptor tyrosine kinase pathway, which is nothing but a JAK STAT pathway. Acidophilic hormones are going to work through JAK STAT pathway, whereas basophilic hormones are going to work through G stimulatory pathway, that is GPCR pathway, G protein coupled receptor pathway. Clear? Why I told you this? Even though it comes under HP axis, it's not typical HP axis. You will, if you remember this carefully, in the last video, I were told growth hormone prolactin, I don't consider as a typical HP axis hormones. Why? Because the reason this GH and prolactin, they don't have a specialized target organ. Specialized target organ. They don't have that. They have multiple target organs. They don't have a specialized target site. But whereas for this basophilic hormones, they have specialized target organ, specialized target organ, as well as they have specialized effector organ. That's what this target organ is the effector organ, which means they have a specialized target organ that is the effector organ. You can see for this ACTH, you have adrenal gland especially the adrenal cortex is what we're going to tell. For TSH, you have the thyroid gland, which is a specialized effector gland for TSH. And for gonadotropins, you have the gonads, testis and the ovaries, specialized peripheral organs that respond to these hormones. But here, there is no single specialized peripheral organ that responds to this prolactin and growth hormone. There are multiple target sites are there, but there is no single specialized site for this particular hormone. Clear? Very, very interesting. But that's why I told you this basophilic hormones are the ones that typically complete this HP axis. Whereas this growth hormone prolactin, you can argue that they are HP axis, but they don't have that specialized effect or organ. That's why I don't call them as a typical HP axis hormones. Hypothalamic pituitary axis hormones. Clear? So these are some of the important points. Embryologically speaking, you know this anterior pituitary is going to come from the uh, Radke's pouch. That is from the pharyngeal ectoderm but very important for the growth of the pituitary if they ask you what is important that is called PIT1. This PIT1 is a pituitary specific positive transcription factor. This PIT1 is very very important because you will see in hypopituitarism cases congenital hypoplasia of the pituitary and all where this PIT1 is really important mutations of PIT1. So PIT1 is the most important transcription factor that is important for growth of the pituitary gland embryologically especially the anterior pituitary. Fine. I told you the posterior pituitary is not under any control. It's directly hypothalamic hormones that are released into the posterior pituitary and you don't have any portal system. This posterior pituitary will not have any portal system. But anterior pituitary, on the other hand, it has portal system. Yes, they do have portal system. They do have this portal system, which means they are controlled by the hypothalamus through this portal system, which means they you have the hypothalamus here which exhibits control through this portal system which means by releasing a lot of controlling hormones and substances through the portal system they exhibit control on the anterior pituitary so they are going to exhibit control on the anterior pituitary so how the hypothalamus exhibits control so what are the hormones that exhibit control for example the somatotrophs are controlled by two hormones. One, you know you have a growth hormone releasing hormone. This is called a GHRH, which is a stimulatory hormone. Similarly, it also has a control through inhibitory hormone called growth hormone inhibitory hormone that is referred to as something called a somatostatin. Remember, the somatostatin was originally identified from the pituitary only. That's why it stat means inhibits the somatotrophs. That's why it's called a somato statin but originally it was called as growth hormone inhibitory hormone clear these lactotrophs are always under inhibitory control predominantly under the inhibitory control that is called dopamine 
So this dopamine is the major inhibitory control for the lactotrophs. Remember, all of them are predominantly under stimulatory control, but only the lactotrophs or mammotrophs, which is releasing prolactin, are constantly under the inhibitory control, except under special circumstances. But again, dopamine is the one that is going to create a strong inhibitory control on the lactotrophs and the mammotrophs. Clear? You have to understand this. And you have another hormone, probable, we don't know this, whether it is existing or not in the first place. But it's highly controversial. There is something called a prolactin releasing hormone. Only physiology textbooks will tell you this, but we really, really don't know. No clinical medicine textbooks are very, you know, like concrete or they are not sure about the presence of this hormone. This is prolactin releasing hormone. We don't know whether it's there or not. But dopamine is a strong inhibitory and it's the only cell that is a thyrotroph. I mean, that's the lactotroph is the only cell that is continuously under inhibitory control from dopamine. And one more a vague stimulant is there that can actually stimulate the lactotrophs to produce prolactin. This is TRH. That's called TSH releasing hormone or thyrotropin releasing hormone. This is a very important signal. Why I will tell you in some time. When you discuss prolactinoma or hyperprolactinemia, where primary hypothyroidism is one of the very important causes of hyperprolactinemia, where you will see because primary hyper Thyroidism, I mean primary hypothyroidism will cause excessive TRH that increased TRH by feedback will result in excessive prolactin also because this TRH can cause a stimulatory signal to the lactotrophs to an extent. So that's why this is a very very important point. Fine. Similarly, corticotrophs are usually under stimulatory control. What is the stimulatory control for the corticotrophs? You know it is CRH that is corticotrophin releasing hormone. Similarly, thyrotrophs are also under stimulatory control that is called a TRH, thyrotropin releasing hormone which is again coming from the hypothalamus and gonotrophs under variable control even though you can think as a stimulatory control but under variable control not really under pure stimulatory control because it depends on whether it is continuous uh, hormone release or pulsatile hormone release depends on that the Secretion of FSH and LH may vary, but what controls is the GNRH that's called gonadotropin releasing hormone GNRH. So these are the various controlling hormones of the anteriority from the hypothalamus, but posteriority really don't have any control hormones because they don't need it because they are essentially the hypothalamic hormones that are secreted through the posteriority. We have told this point multiple times, so no need to repeat again and again. Fine. What are the mechanism of action of these hormones and where they are originating from? Let us see. So let us see the hypothalamic hormones. Hypothalamic hormones and where they are coming from. What are the source and what are the mechanism? What are the receptor mechanism? First is the releasing hormone, growth hormone, releasing hormone. They are going to come from the arcuate nucleus. Remember, the acidophilic hormones, acidophilic controlling hormones. I mean, I'm giving clues actually for you to understand. Acidophilic controlling hormones that control the somatotrophs and the lactotrophs, they actually come from the arcuate nucleus only, which means the dopamine, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter that also comes from the arcuate nucleus and growth hormone releasing hormone also comes from the arcuate nucleus, which means they are going to come from the arcuate nucleus only. Mechanism is G-stimulatory, which means they increase the cyclic AMP. Remember I told you there is no doubt about that in general everything will be GPCR only because I the moment I told you it's hypothalamic hormones means you have to remember it's G protein coupled receptor there is no doubt. Clear? So in that we are going to see what is happening. So it is a G stimulatory. Suppose if you take a dopamine I told you this is also going to come from arcuate nucleus only. So this dopamine is also referred to as prolactin inhibitory factor but no need to know all these things just call dopamine and this is G inhibitory. Obviously it acts through dopamine, dopamine receptors it has to be G inhibitory because they act through D2 receptors. These D2 receptors are G inhibitory which means they reduce the cyclic AMP. Obviously they have to be inhibitory because this dopamine is a strong inhibiting factor. Number three you have gonadotropin releasing hormone gonadotropin releasing hormone so what about gonadotropin releasing hormone it is going to 
come from the certain areas in the hypothalamus which we are going to call it as preoptic area or referred to as median preoptic area clear this is where the gonadotropin releasing hormone is going to come from in the hypothalamus because hypothalamus itself is a constellation of multiple nuclei isn't it so the function is again gq which is going to increase the inositol triphosphate and diacylglycerol this is the mechanism and number 4 you have thyrotropin releasing hormone which is going to come from the paraventricular nucleus which is going to act through gq pathway and number 5 we have corticotropin releasing hormone which is also going to come from paraventricular nucleus which is going to act through g stimulatory pathway which means they are going to increase the cyclic mp this is going to increase the inositol triphosphate and diacylglycerol and sixth one you have growth hormone inhibitory hormone this is what we currently call as somatostatin which is going to originate from the periventricular nucleus obviously they act through receptors called somatostatin receptors we call them as SSTR somatostatin receptor and it will be G inhibitory obviously because it's inhibitory hormone clear fine so these are the important things that you have to know so in general your acidophils are controlled by three different hormones isn't it one is growth hormone releasing hormone and second is your uh, dopamine and third is somatostatin growth hormone inhibitory hormone so these two are going to come from arcuate nucleus arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus and this is going to originate from the periventricular nucleus we saw some time back this is going to originate from the periventricular nucleus in that you know dopamine and growth hormone inhibitory hormone so the receptors will be SSTR here receptors will be D2 receptors here so both will be G inhibitory clear so G inhibitory type whereas GHRH is going to be G stimulatory type we know that GHRH is going to be G stimulatory type similarly basophil cells in the anterior pituitary are controlled by three different hormones again you know one is corticotropin releasing hormone thyrotropin releasing hormone and you have gonotropin releasing hormone you know this crh and trh are coming from a common area called a paraventricular nucleus and this gnrh is going to come from a area called medial preoptic nucleus clear medial preoptic nucleus and you know the action of this trh and gnrh so how trh and gnrh is going to work trh and gnrh are going to work through gq principle and this crh corticotropin releasing hormone is going to work through g stimulatory principle g stimulatory principle clear so we saw that already so that is why i have organized in particular order if you see this organization you will understand much better so that's why i am trying to tell it easier by easier with each passing second so in this video so this is very easy to understand so if you know this so this is how they are controlled by the hypothalamus fine so this is very easy to understand but we have not seen where this oxytocin and vasopressin are originating from where oxytocin or va oxytocin and vasopressin are originating from ADH are originating from the hypothalamus we told hypothalamus gives rise to magnocellular neurons which is going to give rise to this uh, acid I mean uh, ADH and oxytocin but where where in the hypothalamus this oxytocin and vasopressin are generated very important point supra optic nucleus and paraventricular nucleus these are the areas where this magnocellular neurons are going to originate and they are going to give rise to this oxytocin and vasopressin but very important for exams is this supra optic nucleus this is what the usual question exam adh is synthesized from which area of the hypothalamus you have to answer it is supra optic nucleus and probably a little from the paraventricular nucleus also so i think with this you can understand the entire organization of the pituitary I think it will be hope it will be clear we have seen even though it, this look this diagram looks a little bit messy now but it's actually quite simple to understand 
so quite easier to understand i don't want to recap i guess the most important points everything i have told you multiple times what is hypothalamic hypophyseal portal system what do you mean by acidophil basophil chromophobe chromophil postpituitary difference between anterior and postpituitary origin embryologically transcription factor mechanisms which receptors they act through acidophils act through your jackstat pathway basophils act through g stimulatory pathway hypothalamic hormones everything is gpcr but few ex i mean they might be gq gs or ga depending on what controlling hormone it is either inhibitory or uh, releasing hormone depending on that your uh, gpcr pathways will vary clearly these are the some of the questions that are often forgotten exam by the students at the same time it's very common examiner's point of view these are very confusing things so that's why they ask very commonly so i think hope this makes clear and the organization which you have done will be helpful for you during the revision also so with this we'll close down this basic introduction to the pituitary gland with this we'll move on to the specific disorders of the pituitary gland clear